Hello and welcome to The Bittersweet Life. Katie here reminding you one last time to send in sounds that you love, things that you're hearing as you go about your day-to-day -day life. Maybe you love the sound because it represents something specific. Maybe you love the sound just because it's part of your commute to work and you're not used to commuting. Whatever it is, we want to hear the sounds from wherever you are. Pick a sound that means something in your life, record it on a voice memo, and send it to us. Also include a description of what the sound is. You can do that recording your own voice on the voice memo app, or send us an email and we'll read it. Record this and send it to bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. That's bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. Also this week, I want to thank a few longtime supporters of the show. As you know, listener support is the number one reason this show continues. We can't do it without you. So today I want to give a thanks to longtime supporters, Ginny, John, Terry, Heather, and Valerie. Thank you so much for being with us for such a long time. If you're interested in supporting the show, find links in the show notes or visit thebittersweetlife.net. There you'll see a whole bunch of ways that you can join us including by joining us on patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast, where you'll receive two bonus episodes every month. Welcome to Rome. This is the bittersweet life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. This is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. And today we're going to do uh, a little bit of a listener mailbag. I'm going to read a couple emails that we've gotten uh, asking for advice or responding to shows, and then we're going to respond to those emails. And in some cases, we might need to do a little bit more research into some of the questions that are asked, but we'll find out. All right. Okay. So... Let's see. First, I'm going to read one that is just a response to um, an episode we did. And uh, feel free, Tiffany, to chime in if you have some thoughts as I read this. But So this one is in response to an episode we did, an interview with Chelsea Hicks about being a third culture kid. We just started to explore that idea. I'm sure that we could explore the idea of third culture kids a lot more. But basically... A third culture kid is a kid who doesn't grow up in the culture of either of their parents necessarily. They often move around. So if both of their parents, one comes from Italy, one comes from the United States, they might spend some time in Italy, they might spend some time in the United States, but they might also spend a bunch of time living in Portugal or in China or you know all over the world. They're constantly moving. They're not necessarily rooted in the culture of one parent at all. So... That was the uh, episode we did, and that was um, bittersweet moment number 140, if you want to take a listen back to that. And this email came in from John, John on Mercer Island, actually, Oh, which is uh, the suburb of Seattle where Tiffany and I grew up. All right, John writes... Hi, Katie. I thoroughly enjoyed the, your episode on third culture kids. I thought I'd share a bit of insight on the subject since both my wife and I grew up in that environment. My wife is German and her father was a geologist. And besides living in several places in Germany, she lived in Libya from ages four to nine and Houston from 11 to 14 before returning to Germany and finishing her schooling and then went into the German Foreign Service where she lived in India for five years before being posted to Seattle, where we met right after she arrived. I grew up as an Air Force brat, and here are a few observations. As a military brat, we moved every two years or so to various worldwide locations, Japan, France, Germany, several places in the U.S., and then ended up spending a year in Alaska, where I graduated from high school. Kids who grow up in either the civilian environment or military brat environment have a very different worldview than those who grew up pretty much in one place. We learned to make friends quickly, as well as learned how to say goodbye just as fast as we knew we were moving. I always loved going to new places, but some kids struggled with it. The big difference in the brat experience is that, especially overseas, you are living in a little oasis of America, but it really isn't America. 
you are exposed to the country you are in, plus still having some American culture sheltering you and surrounding you. However, for the civilian kids, like my wife, when they went to a new place, they were pretty much on their own, having to try to integrate into a strange new place with few people with their same background in that environment. They had to learn the language of where they were, whereas brats didn't have to. Some thrive on this global nomad experience, and others don't. For my wife, she did love it, but her brother and sister, who live in Germany, have said that they would never want to have their kids exposed to such a life. It took me a while to realize that we were really different than those who grew up in the same community. When I started my sophomore year in high school, we were transferred from California to Wichita, Kansas. By that time, I'd lived in both Europe and Asia. I remember talking to one of the local kids one day who was a year or two older than me, and he asked me if I was new. I said that I was and I had come from California, and he said, I've never been out of Kansas. That amazed me, since the Oklahoma border was just 60 miles away, and I wondered why he didn't have the curiosity to see if Kansas would be different from Oklahoma. Thank you for producing such an interesting show. I look forward to listening to your twice-weekly podcasts. All the best from John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for that. And I know I edited it a little bit, but I really did appreciate hearing your whole story. It's so interesting. Yeah, it is. I think there's part of me that that wishes I had been a third culture kid just because I, I love travel and I love foreign cultures and I would have loved to have had that experience. But the idea of it and the reality of it are probably very different. And I'm sure that it comes with a lot of challenges. Yes, I would think so too. Yeah, and I, I did like his differentiation between what it's like to be part of the military where you know the bases really do sort of mimic a lot of American culture if you are in the American mm -hmm. military. I've heard, I've never actually seen it, but I have heard that within the base, you could go to a McDonald's if you want. You could go to a movie theater and watch a, an American-made movie. You have access to these things that would be normal if you were living in yes. the United States. Yeah, you have like American-style grocery store with like Reese's peanut butter cups and stuff that we can't get over here. Right, um, <laughs> right. It's an enclave. It's a bit of an enclave, but then you can go outside whenever you want and you can... You can visit the outside world. Yes. Yeah. My mom had a relationship with a Frenchman for a couple of years when I was 10 years old. They were very serious. They were very in love. And the relationship was not, um, they were not able to maintain the relationship because they both had young children that they couldn't take away from the other parent, you know? Mm. Um but I remember saying, you know, years later, mom, why didn't we move to Paris when I was 10? That would have been so amazing to grow up in Paris. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but I might have hated it, you know? You might I have. Know. Yeah, because at that point, you might have just wanted to be with your friends, you know? And the last thing you want to do is move away and all the way across the world from those people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Let's do one more. Tiffany, you can read this one. We'll see where we go. All right. Dear Bittersweet Podcast, I've left it all behind on multiple occasions. The first time was back when I was around 22, convincing my mom to sell her house in Seattle and move abroad with me to Europe. We both quit our jobs, sold everything, and packed our single suitcases and three furry animals to Berlin. The second time was a few years later. I found myself back in the U.S. out of job necessity, since getting a work visa is so hard in Europe. I knew that American life just never felt right, and I convinced my boss to let me work remote from Berlin. Fast track a few years later, and I find myself back in the U.S. Once again, it was a career move I thought would be good, but six months into life in the U.S. again, I've realized how my heart and soul remains firmly rooted in Europe. I love learning languages and being in a complete foreign environment. But even more than that, home to me is with my mom. She eventually settled down in Italy, and I can't imagine my life without her or her lasagna. <laughs> I am now 27 with a great job in the U.S. as a user researcher that I am ready to give up if I could just find that open door. I think for over five years, I have been researching different visa schemes that would enable me to live abroad. I know that Portugal has a passive income visa, and so does Spain. I love France for the language, but most of all, Italy is where my heart is. But I have no European citizenship. My mom is on a retirement visa, and I feel like I can't make another move jobless. Well, I can, but I need a visa to stay somehow. 
I'm finding it near impossible to find a job in Europe that would be willing to sponsor a work visa. And I don't have the confidence or motivation to go freelance. Do you think I should go back to school in Italy, for example, so I could at least work part-time and improve my Italian? Should I just move to Portugal with no job and never having been there to see if I could try to find a job while there? I'm so torn. The only thing that keeps me going is I know I don't want a life in the U.S. I love learning languages and want to permanently settle in Europe for good this time. But finding a job, picking the right country, and the visa situation is so hard. Furthermore, if I do go back to school, I would like to change career tracks, perhaps illustration, but Italian universities don't have the best websites for understanding their programs. Are there definitive guides to public Italian universities? The other major thing is taxes. How do Italians survive on so much? <laughs> I'm crying. How do Italians survive on such small salaries and high taxes? This is just a side note. <laughs> Thanks for all your help and great advice. I just love listening while drawing. Best untethered in America. Mm. Well, dear untethered. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> dear untethered in America. Um Wow. I relate to so much of this email. Mm -hmm. So, so much. Because as longtime listeners know, I moved to Europe with no visa and no job prospect. And I was actually 27 when I did it. Oh. And it's funny because the way that she writes, just because she's done so much in her sh relatively short life, I feel like she should be my age by now. Like I could imagine <laughs> someone my age being like, I don't want to move to Europe unless I have a steady job and a work visa. Whereas at 27, I was perfectly happy to just, you know, burn it all down and be like, woohoo, let's see what happens. Of course, we're not all the same. I think a couple of points to keep in mind while we talk about this is that she is number one, willing to give up her great job in America. She's mm -hmm. said that quite clearly. And, uh, and number two, she does not want to be somewhere where she's not, you know, on a visa. She doesn't want to live anywhere illegally. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say that. But I would also say it seems to me that being a, a high priority is being near your mother. So I don't know. I guess it's not it's not that hard of a journey from Portugal to Italy. I don't know where your mother is in Italy, but it seems to me that you should be setting your sights or focusing on somewhere that's near where she is. If that is yes, that's the true. ultimate goal and, and stop thinking like, well, maybe I'll go to Portugal or maybe I'll go, you know, to these random spots and try to figure out like how you can actually be with her if that's the ultimate goal. Yes. Now, um, I don't remember. I, I didn't look when I was reading that to see when she sent this message, but I have seen somewhere in some, I think it was the local, which is sort of an international English language newspaper website, that Italy is, maybe they haven't approved the law yet, but they are working towards a similar law that Portugal has, mm. which is Portugal wants remote workers. Like if you have a remote job somewhere else in the world, you can do that job in Portugal and legally. You're not, you're not working for a Portuguese company. You're working for, let's say an American or a Canadian company, but you, you, you do it remotely and you can live in Portugal. So I think that's what she's talking about, but I believe, and I am not 100% on this, so look it up, but I believe that Italy is at the very least working towards establishing a similar law. Hmm. So that might be the perfect way for her to do this. I mean, the good news, the good thing about living in this, in today's world is that there are a lot of remote jobs out there, a lot more than I pro than probably were around two years ago. So if you know, if she's experienced and, you know, has a lot of uh, skills to offer, she could very likely, I feel, uh, get a re remote position that allows her to work from anywhere in the world. That's half the battle. Like at least like that might not be the visa sorted, but that's at least you have an income. And then just, you know, you need to find a job that either lets you do that sort of remote work visa like Portugal does, or you could en enroll part-time in a university that offers, you know, it, let's say if you're going to Italy, Italian for non-speaking Italians, non-Italian speakers, uh, and, and get some kind of student visa that at least would allow you to stay there. It wouldn't allow you necessarily to work there, but you know, you're not working there, you're working remotely. So that might be, you know, a really good way to do it. I have a question. If her mother is already there living on a retirement visa, is it illegal for her as the daughter of her mother to go live with her mother? Well, it's not that it's illegal. I mean, it's that, that you don't, you, an adult child 
it's not like she's a minor. If she were a minor, then yes, she could get a visa through her mother. Mm. But I, I don't know. The short answer is I'm not 100% sure, but I doubt that you can get a visa for your adult child if you're on a retirement visa. Also because you'd have, well, you'd probably have to prove that you could, you know, at the very least support your child Mm -hmm. already with a retirement visa. You have to prove that you're going to support yourself and you're not going to be a burden to society. Right. So she, you know, but I, I I highly doubt that, that there exists a clause like that for adult children. You're right. And then what about the question of these universities? Like it would be hard for us to recommend not knowing where your mother is, like what universities are around, but do you know of anywhere where people can like look at universities that are for foreign people or it sounds like she's also willing to just go to a public university that's in italian it sounds it doesn't sound like she's unwilling to do something like that yeah i can't remember from this email if she mentioned that she speaks italian or not i'm not sure well she just says that um italian websites italian universities don't have the best websites for understanding their programs so it seems like she's open to it to be perfectly honest i would not recommend italian university yeah i just wouldn't I will, when the time comes, I will highly discourage Aurelio from going to Italian university. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd much rather him go somewhere else in Europe because the Italian university system is famously uh, slow, disorganized. Professors don't show up for classes. You know, a lot of time is wasted. It takes longer than it should to graduate. So I don't know if Italian university would be the right route. I would almost say, see if, and I don't know the law, but see if just studying Italian at like an accredited Italian school, language school is enough to get you a student visa. Because, you know, if you want to live in Italy, you need to speak Italian anyway. So, you you know, you might as well take a class. And if the class gets you a visa, then that's a bonus. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what about that question about the the low salaries and the high taxes? That made you laugh such oh my so much. God. It made me cry. Um, <laughs> cry, laugh, hurt inside. Yeah. yeah I'm, uh, it's hard. It's ridiculous. It's a joke. You know, that's why I say get work for, work for a foreign company, much better to work for an American company and get an American salary. And Hey, the dollar is really high right now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so you won't even lose very much in the, uh, in the, in the exchange rate. You know, there are two main ways to do it in Italy. And one is to have a job where you are an employee and you're being paid a salary. And in that case, the tax penalties are not enormous. Like everyone famously talks about how high Italian taxes are. But if you're not making tons of money, your taxes are not that high. They might be a bit higher than the US. The the minimum salary requirement below which you actually don't have to pay taxes is probably it's probably higher in the U S if that makes sense. But, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard. People don't make a lot of money here. It's true. The cost of living is lower though. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for healthcare. You don't have to pay for university. Not much anyway, a couple thousand euros a year and food is cheaper. Food is cheaper. Gas is more expensive, but gas is one of the few things that's more expensive. And then the other way to do it is to have the partita IVA which is what you need if you're self-employed. The partita IVA used to be impossible because if you were just starting out in your career, you paid almost everything you made in taxes because there was like a minimum of 5,000 euros a year that you had to pay. Mm. So let's say your first year working as a A tour guide (laughs) guide or, you know, a freelance illustrator, what have you, let's say you make 5,000 euros that year, you pay 5,000 euros in taxes, but they've changed it now. Thank God in the past couple of years, they've changed it so that if you make under a certain amount of money and it's not, you know, it's not terribly low. It's not like if you make under 10,000, it's it's significantly higher than that. You basically fly, pay a flat tax of 15%. And that's total. That's like income tax as well as, un, uh, as well as self-employment tax. And you can also, um, write off there's like a one-time percentage write-off instead of writing off your actual bills it's like a automatic deduction sort of a thing and i think it's also like around 15 percent. so it makes it a lot easier for people to be self-employed so that's something to consider and you also have to pay taxes to the u.s too so is that right Yes and no. You own, You have to, re- as an American citizen living abroad, you must report your income to the IRS no matter what. But if all of your income that you're making 
is already taxed in Italy and you can prove that it has been taxed, you do not have to pay tax on it to the United States as well, except for whatever you make over a certain amount. And I think right now it's like about 115,000 a year. Mm. So if you're making under 115,000 a year, you are not double taxed. You're only double taxed on whatever you make above that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I hope that's helpful. That seemed helpful to me, uh, but I'm not doing what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, if I could just give my personal opinion, I think you should do it. I mean, it seems like you know what you want to do and you've, you have experience living abroad. You know that you love it. And I think even if you had to move to Portugal first, first of all, you say you like learning about new cultures and immersing yourself in new cultures. You might find that you adore Portugal and that you want to set up your life there. And you're close enough to your mom that in an hour and a half on an airplane, you can be with your mom. So you might just go that route, but I'd say go for it. Yeah, go for it. Love it. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. If you have a question that you'd like to have us try to tackle or you want to share a story like John did about your own experience and past, you can always write to us, bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. You can also send us a note through social media. Yes, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just search for the Bittersweet Life Podcast. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Join us again. Bye. If you love the show, take a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love to read while you listen, and your rating might help someone else discover the show. Take just a couple of minutes to let the world know what you think of this show. It means the world to us. Thanks. Thanks.